Welcome to lesson eight. So in this lesson, we're finally going to get around to learning actual command line commands. We'll be reviewing a lot of material from chapter two of the Beyond the Basic Stuff with Python course textbook. And you can find that textbook for free online at inventwithpython.com beyond. Now you can watch this video and you can take notes, but really the best way to learn these commands is to actually just practice using them. We're going to be covering a lot of file system related commands, uh, commands that can copy files or move them or rename them or delete them, that sort of thing. So let's go ahead and cover our first command. This is something that we've used before. It's the cd command to change directories in the command line. So right here, the prompt on Windows shows you what the current working directory is. And so any relative file paths that I enter for commands are going to be relative to this folder right here, the al folder inside the users folder inside the uh, C drive root. Say I wanted to uh, change directories to the desktop folder. This is referring to the desktop folder inside the al folder inside users right here. So all of these relative file paths, which are file paths that don't begin with the root folder. So if I began it with a root folder here, c colon slash, that's the root folder. Um, this would be an absolute file path. So I'm providing the full absolute file path here. But if I just use a relative file path, it's always relative to the current working directory. And the cd command changes the current working directory in this terminal window. So I could enter cd desktop, and you can now see that the prompt shows that I'm now in the desktop folder. This is what the CWD setting is for this terminal window right now. Of course, if I had other terminal windows open, every terminal window can have its own current working directory. So here this is in users slash al, while this one is in users slash al slash desktop. Now, if a folder has spaces in its names, you want to enclose the name in double quotes. For example, cd, I have a folder here called vacation photos. I can enclose those in double quotes. Otherwise, the terminal window will think that you're actually supplying two different command line arguments. Probably the easiest thing to do in this case is just to use tab completion to have the terminal automatically add those double quotes. Now, if you want to change the current working directory, the CWD, to the user's home folder, you can enter cd percent sign user profile percent sign on Windows. On Mac and on Linux, it's a little bit easier. Let's see, let's, I'm going to cd into the desktop folder here. Let me just clear the screen real quick. And let's say I I'm in some folder and I want to go back to the home folder, I can just type cd tilde. Because tilde on Linux and Mac OS is sort of the shorthand for the user's home folder. Now on Mac OS and Linux, there's also an additional command, print working directory, pwd. And this is good just to show you the absolute file path to the current working directory. So tilde is just a shortcut for slash home slash al because that's my username on this computer. This percent sign that's surrounding user profile is because user profile is an environment variable, and we'll go into that in the next lesson. Now on Windows, if you also want to change the current drive to something other than the C drive, you can just enter the letter of the drive that you want to change it to. So for example, I have a USB thumb drive plugged in right now. That's my D drive. I can just enter D colon and then I can change the directory to some other folder on the D drive, on the thumb drive. And don't forget, the special dot dot folder name means the parent directory, so if I wanted to go back up to the root D drive folder here, I could just type in cd dot dot to go up a folder. Next, let's learn how to list folder contents with the dir and ls commands. On Windows, the dir command displays the folders and files in the current working directory. Let me go back to my home folder, and then I'll enter the dir command 
and you can see all of the files and folders. The folders are labeled here with this dir part for directory, and the files, you can see the file size of these, as well as the last modification timestamp. And at the bottom here on Windows, it shows you how many files and, and directories there are, and how many bytes total all the files in this directory take up. Now on macOS and Linux, the ls command does the same thing. It lists the contents of the current working directory. So I can type ls right here, and we get all of these files and folders. Now this will be different depending on what type of Linux you're running or if you're on macOS, but here in Ubuntu Linux, the folders are all marked with this light blue text right here. But if you want to see more information, you can use the dash L and dash A command line arguments or switches as they're also called. So I can type ls dash AL to use both of them. And now you can see sort of similar to the dir out command output. There's a lot of files as well as timestamps and file sizes, along with a lot of file permission information right there. This is a bit beyond the scope of this lesson right here. So the dash L command line option displays a long listing format that includes this file size permissions and timestamp information, while the dash A command line argument displays all of the files, including the ones that begin with a period, and that's usually just a convention for hiding these files from the normal output. You can see when I do just ls-l without the a, I don't see those files that begin with a period in their name. And those are often just used for configuration files that you generally shouldn't be messing around with, so you're probably uninterested in those files, which is why they aren't displayed by default. Now, if you want to list the subfolder contents as well, on Windows you can run the dir slash s command. That's the dir command with the slash s command line argument. And this will show you the current working directories folders, as well as the contents of all the subfolders in that folder. So for example, let me just change directory to slash github slash easy gmail on my computer. I can say dir slash s, meaning show all of the subfolder contents as well, and I want to see all of the .py files in the current working directory here in github slash easy gmail, but also in all the folders inside easy gmail as well. I want to see all of the .py files. Remember, this is a wildcard character that stands for any character, any group of characters right here. So I want file names that match this pattern of anything followed by .py at the end. And here we can, for example, right here we can see here's the folder that I'm currently in as my CWD, and then here's a couple of subfolders in there, and then here's the .py files in there. So I can see there's 4,000 .py files, totaling about 47 megabytes. Now to do this on Linux and Mac OS, you'll want to run a different command, the find command. Let me just clear the screen right here. And pass it dot space dash name. And if you want to use wildcards, you should put it inside of double quotes right here. Let me go ahead and go up a directory and press the up arrow key twice to get the command history to re-enter this command right here. Whoa, and there's there's a lot more files in that, that time. <laughs> so you can see these are all .py files inside dot. Remember, dot is a special name, meaning this folder, your current working directory. So I have an opener.py in that folder, but also in the subfolder, py out of GUI, this slash docs, I have another .py folder there, and so on and so on. Next, let's learn about copying files with the copy command on Windows and the cp command on Linux. This is very straightforward. If you want to make a duplicate copy of a file, you can type copy followed by the name of the file you want to copy. I'll just say hello.py. And then along with the folder that you want to copy the file to. So say I want to move it to that vacation photos folder. 
Now if I go into vacation photos and I want to display all of the .py files, you can see I have a hello.py file inside of this folder now as well. Let me go back there. You can also copy this to a new name. If I want to get a copy of hello.py and name it hello2.py. And now when I display all the .py files in this folder, you can see I have the original one, hello.py and hello2.py. And you can combine those two to copy it not only to a new folder, but also with a new name as well. You can see I have my new hello3.py file that I've copied into the vacation photos with this new hello3.py name. Now on macOS and Linux, this works the same way except the command is called cp. So I could type cp hello.py and give it the name hello2.py. And you can see here's the original file and then the new copy that I've created of it. Now, when I first started learning the Linux operating system, I was surprised to find that the Windows copy command that I knew was named CP on Linux. The name copy was much more readable than CP, which looked really terse and cryptic. And really, was that, was that worth saving two characters worth of typing? But as I gained more experience in the command line, I realized that the answer is actually yes. So we read source code more often than we write it, so using verbose names for variables and functions is really helpful there. But we type commands into the command line much more often than we read them, so in this case, the opposite is true. Short command names make the command line easier to use and reduce strain on your wrists. Next, let's learn how to move files and folders with the move and mv command. So on Windows, you can move a source file or folder to a destination folder by running the move command along with the file or folder name about goodbye.py and then followed by the destination folder. Let's say I wanted to move it to the desktop folder. I could enter a relative file path like this or I could go ahead and enter the full absolute path uh, both of these approaches would do the same thing here. And so now if I try to find the goodbye.py file, goodbye.py file no longer exists in my home folder. But if I move up to desktop, I can see that it now exists right here. I've moved it from slash user slash al to slash user slash al slash desktop. And here on Linux, the command is slightly shorter. It's the mv command for move. And you specify the file that you want to move, say this hello.py, and I'm going to move this to the desktop folder. See now the hello.py file that I had is now no longer here, but if I go to the desktop, I can see it now exists here in this folder. Now one thing that you can do in Linux with the mv command is that you can move a file and give it a new name at the same time. So I say I wanted to move that hello2.py file to the desktop, but also give it the name goodbye2.py. I can see that I've both moved it, but also renamed the file to a new file name. Next, let's learn how to rename files and folders with the ren and mv commands. So on Windows, running ren followed by the file that you want to rename. Let's say I want to rename goodbye.py, and then followed by the new name of the file. Let's say goodbye to .py. This will rename the file on Windows. 
You can see there is no goodbye.py anymore because I've renamed it to goodbye2.py. Meanwhile, on Linux, the mv command does double duty. It can move the file, but it can also rename the file as well. And if you move the file to the current directory that it already exists in, but with a new file name, you're effectively just renaming the file. So there is no rename command or anything like that in Linux. Instead, you would just use the move the mv command for that. So I could say uh, move spam.py, and instead of, instead of a folder, I would just give it a new name, say spam2.py. And now I've renamed that file. Now to delete a file or a folder on Windows, you would want to run the del command, followed by the file or folder that you want to delete. Let's try hello2.py. And now you can see the hello2.py file is gone. Now you want to be somewhat careful on the command line because this doesn't send the file to the recycling bin. Instead, it just deletes it. On Linux, deleting is done by the rm command. So I could remove, which is what the rm stands for, spam2.py. And now you can see that file has been deleted. Now these two delete commands have some slight differences. On Windows, running Dell on a folder, for example, this delicious folder, which contains a spam.txt and a cats and walnut subfolders, which also contain their own files, running Dell delicious on this folder will delete all of its files, but not the subfolders. Walnut and cats won't be deleted. You have to do that with the rd command, which I'll explain in a little bit. Additionally, running delete on a folder on Windows won't delete any files inside the subfolder, so these files are untouched. Now if you want to delete those files, you need to run del with the slash s and slash q command line arguments followed by the folder name. That will delete the files from the subfolders, although it still won't delete the subfolders themselves. The slash s stands for subfold delete from subfolders and then the slash q is the quiet mode where it will tell the delete command to not ask you for confirmation before it deletes every file now on mac os and linux you can't use the rm command to delete folders but you can run rm r on the folder and that will delete the folder and all of the subfolders and files within it if you want to do that on Windows, you need to use the rd remove directory command with the slash s and slash q command line arguments followed by the folder name. That will delete the folder and all of its contents as well. Now we can make new folders with the md and make dir commands. So running md followed by a new folder name on Windows. This will create a new empty folder named some folder. I could change directory into it and see that it's empty. On Linux, we'll use the make dir command, which is spelled mkdir. And you can see I've also created a new empty folder. Now to delete a folder, first of all, I have to get out of the folder itself. But here on Windows, I can use the rd or remove directory command. I'll just follow it up with the name of the folder I want to remove. And now you can see that folder no longer exists. On Linux, this is almost the same. It's rmdir followed by the folder name. Next, we're going to look at the where and which commands, which are commands that can help us find the absolute file path of a program. So running where, followed by a program name, say calc.exe, on Windows, 
will tell me the absolute file path of where this program file is. Now when I enter a command or a program on the command line such as calc.exe to launch the calculator program, the computer is checking for a program with this name in the folders listed in the path environment variable, and I'll cover path and environment variables in a future lesson. Uh, another example is when I run Python to run the Python interactive shell. If I want to find where is this python.exe file located, I can run where Python, and the where command will tell me that it's, it exists here inside this folder. Now where will also tell me that there is another python.exe file located in this folder as well, but it's this particular Python program that's running the one that is Python 3.9. You can verify that right here. Now on Linux, this is the which command. So if I say which Python 3, it gives me the absolute file path of where this Python 3 program file is. It's in slash user slash bin slash Python 3. This is the, uh, the name of the program itself, and it's in this folder. These commands are very useful if you want to find out what exactly is running when you enter a program name, such as Python for Python 2. I can see that that's listed also in user slash bin. And the next command is fairly simple. You've probably seen me using this command a few times before in these lessons, but on Linux, it's the clear command to just clear all the text from the terminal. Say you just aren't really interested and you want to start from a clean slate, you can enter clear and that will erase all of the text from the terminal. So no matter how much information is there, you can just type clear to clear it out. Now on Windows, this is actually the CLS for clear screen command, and that does the same thing. Okay, so the best way to get comfortable with these commands is to go ahead and practice actually using them. You can work on some dummy files that you don't care about and just practice copying them, moving them around, renaming them, deleting them, uh, creating some new folders and deleting folders just to get some experience. And to help you with that, I'm going to go into some bonus content. This actually isn't covered in the course textbook, but there's also the touch command on Linux. And touch is used, you could specify some existing file. Let me find a file to use here. How about this uh, foo.jpg file right here? You can see the timestamp is from October 4th. But if I use the touch command on that file, this will update the last modified timestamp. So you can now see today is February 3rd. I've now just updated the timestamp. And touch is useful for a variety of system administration tasks, just if you need to, for some reason, update the um, last modified timestamp. But what you can also use touch for is to just create a new blank file. Say I wanted to create a foo.py file. I can run touch foo.py. And now you can see I've created an empty file. It takes up zero bytes named foo.py. Now there is no touch command on Windows, but what you can do is use the copy command and copy a special name. This is null. This basically means no content, but you can copy that to a new file, say foo.py right here. And that does the same thing. You can see it creates an empty file of zero bytes in size named foo.py. And now you can practice uh, copying this file to new names or moving the file around. And that way you won't have to worry about accidentally deleting your real files. Okay, so in the next lesson, we're going to go into environment variables and specifically the path environment variable. And that's a really useful thing to know about when you're trying to get Python installed and up and running on your computer, but you're encountering some errors or difficulties doing that.